put it to the officer at data. Um, what that means is I usually end up getting asked to solve the problems that no one else wants to solve. <laughs> um, and that is true. we're going to be talking about SEO. And I am Leah Clocker, and I'm an account developer with Data, and I support our partners in their overall marketing strategy and achieving their marketing goals. All right, so Leah, what are you drinking today? What am I doing here today? What I. Drinking? What am I drinking? Vodka tonic. Vodka tonic. Classic. What are you doing? I have uh, a dark. What did I choose? Black butte porter. That's what I love. Oh, it's black beer quarter. Very good. In this Delicious. rainy, dreary day. Dark beer for a cold day. Come on, y'all. Please help you get through an SEO presentation. Yes. Everyone <laughs> at home, pour yourself a cold one. Yeah. All right. So this training was originally presented internally at Data. So it's a little, um, I'd say, maybe less professional than some of our more corporate trainings, like the ones people pay us for. At events, this is not something we have posted, for instance, at any leading age. This is largely meant for our internal team, but today we're sharing it with all of you. Um, we did shorten it down a bit. Some of the slides were very text heavy, but if you want the full version of the slides for your notes or to keep track with us, you can go to datamarketing.com, WTF SEO. You can see the address right there. Um, and you'll be able to download the full slides for today, which include a few more notes, a few more examples. They're a little less fun, but maybe more helpful if you're actually trying to do the things we talk about today. All right, so with that, we will get started. Okay, so Leah, this is how search engines work in a nutshell. You have a search engine, and search engine has little spiders, and it sends out these little spiders, and these spiders crawl throughout the whole internet. And the spiders take notes on your titles, keywords, your description, basically everything about your website, uh, figures out what your website's about, and how to categorize you, and then it categorizes you, and then that's what the search engine serves up when you search for results. And that's basically how the whole thing works. Aaron. Is it the same for Yahoo, Google, Bing? Mostly. They all have slightly different spiders and slightly different algorithms and things that matter to them. Bing interprets a few things as different levels of importance in Google, but Google really redefined the game when it launched. And so this model um, of spiders going throughout the internet, tracking everything, pulling it in and organizing it, that's the model that they all underlyingly use, but we'll go into how Google kind of revolutionized the game a little bit down the line. Because as you may have guessed, if it was this simple, we wouldn't need to do a webinar about it or any team training. All right, so there's a little more to the Google equation and to SEO in general. Uh, for one, there's over two trillion searches per year, and that is on Google alone. So if you take Bing and all the people that accidentally are still on Yahoo, that's probably a few fraction fire. <laughs> <laughs> there are 300 to 500 web pages created every minute. And I know data is responsible for a fair number of those, but not all of them. <laughs> and that leads to probably thousands of ranking factors. So this, I think, is a really important point when we're talking about SEO to focus on. Is A lot of people want to talk about SEO as if it was... Dungeons and Dragons rule book number six or something like that. And if you get that edition and you go and you look in the index for your specific rules, you'll figure out what you're supposed to do for SEO and then it'll happen. Like they want to treat SEO kind of like a game where you get the right points and then you win. And SEO might be that way at some level, but realistically, it, there are so many factors weighing differently and getting tweaked every day that there's not really the ability to pick <coughs> most SEO things down to one or two or three issues. So if someone comes by and says, your images don't have any alt text and you'll never rank on Google if your images don't have any alt text, um, that's probably, that's one thing, right? But Aaron, I wanna be first on the first page. It's so important to be first. Well, you and unfortunately everyone else would like to be first. So that's <laughs> why we run into this issue. I think the first most important thing is to remember that although you want to be first, what does Google want? Because it's really, I mean, Bing, Yahoo, they matter, but really it's about what does Google want? 
And what Google wants to do is serve the best results. <coughs> okay, so we said there's 200 likely thousands of ranking factors. There are some broad categories to those. And I'll explain kind of why these are the broad categories Google cares about as we go through them. So first of all, I like to think of it as a kind of pyramid because you can't, a lot of people want to go right to the top or the second tier of the pyramid, but they've neglected the base of the pyramid. And so if you tried to build a pyramid from the top down, that would be, well, the human race probably wouldn't have gotten very far. <laughs> um, so the first tier of the pyramid is technical setup. Because if we think back, I mean, Google is using spiders, which are not technically spiders. They're little algorithms, little bots that go and search the internet. And they basically travel from link to link, from site to site, and they index it. Well, if it can't get into your site, guess what that means? Probably no indexing. Um, if it gets on your website and then your website turns out to be some sort of con man, like standing in a dark alley trying to sell Rolexes when you came there for, I don't know, to answer queries about ducks, the spider's gonna be like, whoa, this is some shady stuff. I don't know about this. And then finally, if it gets in there, but it just can't go anywhere, your site's broken and you can't read any of it, that's going to be an issue. And your site, you know, flat out might not show up on Google due to those issues let alone appear in the top three or whatever, it won't show up. So that's the first year of the pyramid. Now, if I just created my website five, 10 years ago when my business started, Aaron, and I wasn't too sure about links, how do I know if if my foundation is even set? How do I know if, if it structurally is all set up? If you haven't touched it in five to six years, I'd say there's like a 0% chance of that. Um, but what you would have to do at that point, and this is something a lot of SEO companies sell, is a technical audit. So you would need to do a scan of your website. A lot of SEOs, we use the same technology Google uses. So we send a little bot out there that spiders your website and it reports back to us the same results that Google would see on their end, basically. We don't know all the factors and we don't know how to weigh them the same way Google does, but we can see the basic ones, which I'll cover on the next slide or two. Um, those are things you want to identify and fix before you go on to really trying to get your website to rent. And if you have an older site, I mean, I think this is really, this is a quarterly, if not monthly thing you probably need to be doing. But let's say you got that base of the pyramid in place. Your website's technically up to snuff. All your links are working. It's not a spammy website. Okay, number two, and this is, one that people don't always seem to understand is the valuable content piece. A website should not be out there on the internet just to exist. Um, people don't want to go to websites that just exist. People go to websites to solve problems. So if your website isn't solving any problems, you shouldn't be surprised that no one shows up to it. So when you think of valuable content, it's not just that it's long content or that it's written well or uh, that it's funny, it's it's that it's actually solving someone's problem for them. It's information someone would look for in the first place. And in this next section on content, we talk a little bit about how you can structure that and figure out, am I writing stuff that people care about or not? And it's not just about putting the same word in 15 times into each page or something like that. There's no magic when it comes to the content keywords anymore. Good to know. Yes, that's actually a pre Google tactic. It's going to take a sec to type our link into our chat there for anyone who might be arriving a little bit later. You can also see that it's on the slides. Okay, so then the third platform comes up a lot is links, right? And a lot of people will advertise link building services, which we'll talk about why that might be a good or bad idea. But links are really kind of the social currency of SEO almost um, the same way if a friend likes your post, they're saying, hey, I approve of this, or depending on the emoji they use, they might not approve of it, but they paid attention to it. A link is kind of like that for websites, and we'll discuss why Google made that decision and how it kind of revolutionized the world of search engines. Kind of a fascinating story. Um, but it is a case of more links is not necessarily better, which is a common misunderstanding you run into. 
And when you say links, do you say links to other sites, Aaron? So if I were doing links mm -hmm. and I didn't know, I was just building my website or looking at it from about a five-year perspective, how do, you, how do you refer to links? When I say links, I usually mean websites linking to your website. Ah. It's good if your website to link to other websites are relevant. It's good for your website to link to its own pages. It's really critical, however, that other websites link to you if you want to be found and you rank well on Google. That's one of the biggest things in SEO. And we'll walk through why that is, because it's a really big key in Google's difference, or, or was when Google was invented. And then finally, that kind of golden piece of the pyramid, which is what Google is always working towards, is called Rank Brain, which takes our kind of rule book concept of SEO, of these, these are the rules we can follow to get these results, to get this score with the search engines to rank here. Rank Brain takes all of that and really says, no, you can't do that. Because what Rank Brain is, is a machine learning AI algorithm that is basically trying to do a lot of Google's optimizing for it. So it's trying to predict based on your past behavior and behavior of other people like you, what are the results you actually want to see? So when we get Rank Brain involved, it's not a matter of, is my content generally valuable? It's a matter of, will Leah specifically at this mm. stage in her life find this content valuable? And so Google's really trying to go I mean, Google's whole goal with this is to be unpredictable with how you're running, right? They don't want you to know. They would really prefer you pay for that. What Google wants to do is keep advertising eyeballs pointed at the Google screens because they're delivering good results that mean we don't want to go to big in the office. That's their whole goal. Okay. Technical setup, everyone's favorite piece. <laughs> you love audits. Everybody loves audits. Teach us how. What does it mean? <laughs> <laughs> well, luckily, there are about a thousand different, no, there's way more than a thousand different ways to build a website. So there's a way, way, way more than a thousand different things that can go wrong with a website. But there's some really key basics. Um, Google can find and index your website. One of the biggest issues I see happening, one of the most basic SEO things that can happen is when you launch a website and you leave what's called the robots.txt set to not allow Google to index your website. So we talked about those little spiders that crawl throughout the internet from Google and index everything. Well, web designers, when we're making a website, we put a piece of code on the website that tells the spider how to interpret it. And if I'm, for instance, working on a WordPress website, um, and I just have it on my development server and it's not ready for prime time, I would put a tag there that says, robot, go away. Not for Google, not for Google's eyes yet. And that's great when the website's in development. But if I launch the website and forget to take that switch off, that's really bad. Now, if someone, Aaron, were to d want to choose a cost-effective model or possibly a template to create their website and they go online and find a template, generally are these companies and resources that provide templates, do they take this into consideration or do they just provide a beautiful kind of staging site for, for people to, to use and create their, um, to put their content on? Um. I think for the most part, it just, like if you are working with WordPress and you're thinking, I'm just gonna go and I'm gonna go get HostGator or GoDaddy as my hosting, and then I'm gonna mm -hmm. go on to Theme Forest and I'm going to search WordPress themes for architects and pick a pretty one. You know, there's nowhere in there that's really gonna guide your hand and say whether or not your website is set up or not. Mm -hmm. There's no, you're bowling without the guards on, so to speak. Um, now, you may think, oh, I picked the consumer friendly choice because I picked GoDaddy. I picked WordPress because 24% of the web runs on it. And I picked ThemeForest because they're easy drag and drop templates. Mm -hmm. But that whole system is actually really complex underneath the hood. And it takes, you know, you would need to go through a decent amount of training to really understand if your website is optimized or not. Now, when you use a kind of all more than one platform like Wix, Weebly, Squarespace, um, you usually don't have as many hurdles with SEO because, for instance, 
if your website is not published in Squarespace and then it is, usually Google takes care of that tagging issue for you in terms of mm-hmm. Google index it or not. The downside of that is sometimes those platforms can have very built in issues with Google that you can't fix. Um, so for example, Squarespace, some of those templates, um, whatever you type into your banner area gets used with your site's description for that page in Google. And from a design perspective, that's kind of okay, but we might not want the text that we see on Google when you're searching for that page to show up in the banner of that page. Mm-hmm. That doesn't, those texts usually don't line up there completely different purposes. So it's really a mixed bag in terms of which platforms are going to be the best at SEO. WordPress definitely has some hurdles, but WordPress also has the benefit of having a development community that's very devoted to it. Um, Other than that, I think Duda, the website builder we use for smaller sites, is one of the best optimized I've seen. Squarespace, hmm, not thrilled with. Weebly and Wix have had some issues over the years, Wix especially. Yeah, that's good to know, especially if you're deciding or making investments in Google ad dollars and deciding to redo your website, update your website, invest in a website, and then where to go next. Yes, I would say a new WordPress website can really cripple your SEO if it's not done well. Okay. And one of the biggest things I see is just developers forgetting to uncheck that thing to make the website actually indexable on Google. I've seen websites go for years without that thing pop. And if I am ranking, you mm, told them not to. The other side of that, and this is something that um, Wix ran into for a while, is Google being able to effectively crawl your website. So you remember, oh gosh, back when I was in high school and every website had like a flash loading screen. Yes. And you had to wait for the flash to load and go yes. through the flash intro and maybe like click some buttons in an exact sequence to get to the website content. Well, guess what? Spiders can't do that. <laughs> You really have to make sure that your design functionality is not blocking out the search engine, which it really can. So let's say you get past the Google can find and index your website. Well, now it's kind of index it correctly. And this is another issue we see with different CMSs sometimes, like WordPress, for instance, can result in a lot of duplicate content issues because WordPress likes to, WordPress was originally built to be a blogging platform and likes to generate tags and categories and author profiles and separate links for each of those. So now all of a sudden you post one blog, but you've got one blog, one author page, one category page, one page for any tags you used. It just generated 16 pages to go with the one you made. So, mm-hmm. You know, if SEO was really a concern for you, you might have to take some efforts to, um, set it up so that it doesn't produce so many pages, they redirect to one another. Basically, you wanna make sure that content only lives at one URL. So you've all seen it when, you know, you have a web page and it's got this ridiculously long URL, and most of it is just a tag added on for marketing purposes. If that's not set up correctly, Google, the search engine, will see that as two completely different websites, or two completely different web pages and say, uh, you're kind of just posting the same thing over and over again on your website. Mm, not super creative. Yeah. So it's a little bit hard because you have to simultaneously design your website for humans, but functionally you have to make sure that the robots can understand it too. And they're stupid. The other basic things, um, mobile friendly. When I first started at agencies, mobile friendly was, the big trend. Now mobile first is the way they index, which I'm not sure everyone always understands what mobile first indexing means. Um, but it means that, you know, Google has this index of spiders that crawl everything and crawl through the internet. And they used to have two indexes, right? Mm-hmm. They have spiders called the mobile web and spiders call the desktop web. Now they only call the mobile web. Not only, but that's their main source and that's where they're going from. And when they index your website, that's usually what they're basing it on. So the trend that we used to see in the early days of having a really slimmed down mobile site, that just does not work anymore. No. So the other key things then, um, mobile friendly, 
is it secure? Google Chrome will warn you if it doesn't have the little secure lock up in the front that says, hey, this website's trustworthy. It can encrypt information back and forth. Um, and then load speed. That's both a can Google actually load your website and also uh, Google's looking at how long it takes to load on average. And what it's saying is if your website is painfully slow to load, it's probably a painful experience and we don't really want people throwing their phones across the room after they use their search engine. So we're gonna send them to a faster neighbor site. So I think this is perhaps the most frustrating tier of SEO because there's so many little things that can go wrong. It's also the tier that I think you end up with a lot of snake oil salesmen at. So it's, yeah. it's really critical to have someone, if they're going to dissect your website and give you, let's say, grade one out of 100 for where it's scoring and then tell you how to improve it, make sure you have someone that can talk you through each thing on why it actually matters to Google and make them kind of explain this one's more important than this one because of this. It's too often I see I mean, you've seen those automated audits that customers sometimes get, and they send mm -hmm. it, but like, it's only got 30. What's it mean? And if you were to give Aaron like a top five in the technical setup to make sure that, you know, if there's, if there's a lot to consider, make sure you're recognizing these five things, what would you maybe say would be five really important technical components to make sure is, are buttoned up on your site? First one is just that it can be indexed. Uh, second one is secured. Third one is mobile friendly. Like those three are non-negotiable. Mm -hmm. Site speed is a little hard to say non-negotiable because it's all scale. But outside of that, what I would say is just making sure that your website is not a clustered disaster of content all over. Mm -hmm. It's kind sure. of the key. You want to make sure that it works in a logical manner for Google to go through. Things like, um, oh, like having correct um, meta tags for each site. Mm -hmm. That's not as critical. There's some stuff that can Google can figure out, but the big thing, those top three are mobile friendly, secured, actually indexable by Google, and then giving it a map to know how to index the rest of your site, which would be called a site map or something like that. But I'm always suspicious of any website audit that just turns out a score and a lot of warning signs without explaining why it's critical why? to do things. Yeah. A lot of those will rank different things high, like all equally. Yeah. It's like, okay, that's not having alt images is a little different than like not being able to access the site at all through a search engine. Yeah. Okay. All right, that's the first tier of the pyramid. The Google Webmaster Tools, this is a tool set I think not enough people use. In my opinion, if you have a website, someone at your company or agency needs to be monitoring it via Google Webmaster Tools. And this is because this is your biggest health indicator on all those technical standpoints. Um, how do you know something really matters to Google? Because it tells you in Google Webmaster Tools when it's broken. That's a big sign. So Google Webmaster Tools, it's a tool similar to Google My Business, basically. You go, you sign up, you claim your website. Um, there's a couple different ways to claim it. Some involve code, some just involve analytics. And then it will send you alerts. For instance, if you have too many 404s, or if a page of your site isn't mobile friendly, or let's say you get hacked, mm. it will actually scan and detect that for you. And, and it can will you, tell you, yep, go on. And can you and can you just set that up with an email? So if I want to monitor that for my company, Google will just email me those 404 errors or any other technical issues that they're finding. It'll Google you when there's an error, but you'll also just want to go in and check every once in a while on your website health. Okay. It'll say, okay, this much of your website, we have this many pages indexed for you. Now that's kind of an important thing to know. If you have a 12 page website and you suddenly got 200 pages indexed, mm. something doesn't line up there. So absolutely Google Webmaster Tools. Once you install Google Analytics, this should be the second thing. And you should not, you can get it for free. You don't need to buy an expensive monitoring tool. Uh, Google Webmaster Tools will do a lot of that for free. And why? Because Google wants the internet to be better for their customers. Second tier. 
everyone's favorite tier to talk about as marketers. You need valuable content. And that does not mean it matters how much you pay the copywriter, although, I mean, if you're really getting a steal of the deal, there's probably a reason. <laughs> and when you say content, Erin, is this blogs? Is this pictures? Is this words? Is this what? what's all valuable of content? All of it. This is all of it. So the structure of the website is just, can Google find it? Can Google sort it correctly? Is anything really broken or suspicious here? That's the first thing that's going to get it blocked. This is about actually showing up in the search engine when someone is searching for you. Um, the valuable content is content that people want to read, look at, research. It has value to someone. It's something that they would be searching for. Um, I think a lot of times we run into, well, why isn't this page coming up? And it's really a page that maybe people need to know to search for. Maybe it's something they don't yet know about. Um, the valuable content is really about, I mean, the core marketing thing here is about understanding your audience and your audience's journey when they're making a buying decision. You could write all the useful content in the world for how to raise guppies, but if you are not selling guppies, that may not be very useful to you. This is true. If you're trying to sell like hardware nuts and bolts things and you're writing about guppies, yes, you might get searchers, but they're probably not looking for your product. Gonna buy your product, yeah. This is kind of twofold. This is both about picking content that's relevant, picking content that's relevant at the right stage of each buyer's journey, and then making sure it is formatted in a way that Google can read and understand what it's about. User journeys, kind of our favorite thing at data. Yes. All right, so a lot of people want to talk about SEO without necessarily understanding what natural search behavior looks like, right? Because we don't just search once, make a decision, and then go for it. When we are making a decision, especially a longer decision, we may have searches in different places around different sorts of queries all throughout our decision-making journey. So what I've got charted here, and there's another example in the full slideshow on our website, it's at datamarketing.com slash WTF SEO. Um, this is a potential user journey for someone who has acne, which I'm pretty familiar with because I've had acne. Most people have. Yes, we have. <laughs> um, but for a lot of people, the first thing is just how to prevent acne. And so potential free phrases would be acne prevention, cystic acne prevention. How to cure acne. You gotta think of phrases that a consumer would plug in. And you have to think of it at different levels of that consumer, because this could be, you know, some poor 28 year old who's really trying to look professional around her workplace, or it could be um, poor 16 year old. <laughs> or a poor 16 year old who's just trying to survive high school. And neither of those two audiences are going to put it in anything near the terms that a dermatologist would speak, right? Like they're not gonna say postules and Mm -hmm. So it's really thinking through that. Um, so step one, they're going to search, how do I prevent acne in some way or another? And then in that research, they're going to find some solutions, right? And they're going to, okay, so chemical exfoliants are a good thing for preventing acne and helping me work on acne. But there's all this stuff out there. This, these first few articles I found, they only kind of explain it. Well, I want to know more about chemical exfoliants. So we go down another rabbit hole. And then we look, okay, I've decided that chemical exfoliants, that is a good idea. I need one of those. I've determined that these two brands are the top ones. Now I'm going to go do more research on those. And here the thing with SEO is they're not necessarily going to go to those brand sources only. In fact, they'd be kind of weird if they did, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Who are you going to trust? Paula's choice. She's going to say hers is best. Mm -hmm. And then finally, when you're ready to make the decision, you would start looking for purchase indicating. So, I mean, in some transactions, you do ch jump right to choice. Um, the classic example is, ah, crap, my garage door is broken. Mm. <laughs> That's a pretty quick <laughs> people searching broken garage door on a mobile phone at 6 a.m., they're usually right at that choice phase and they haven't yes. had a whole lot of research time. <laughs> um, but for people who are looking in a bigger transaction or something they have more time around, 
it probably does look more like this. I'm hard pressed to think of many purchases I've made in, made, where I've made where it hasn't been kind of this multi-tiered rabbit hole. Mm -hmm. But now let's look at how Paula's Choice, who, as a disclaimer, has invested in an ornament amount of time and money in their marketing to SEO. Let's see how they get in charge of this user journey. All right, so we've got the awareness level. And you can see, how to prevent acne. This is going to be a really popular term, right? And it's also a medical term, so we're going to see a lot of authority figures ranking for it. So you can see our first one is WebMD.com, Medical News Today, Healthline. Those domains are very trustworthy in Google's eyes. Mm -hmm. Google kind of knows the difference between a doctor domain with a ton of trust and a store that has really valuable content marketing which is what Paula's Choice is. So even though they've probably spent more money than these other uh, people on ranking for this choice, they're still going to be a little lower, and they probably can't get much higher than that. Just they're selling something. Mm -hmm. They're not as useful as WebMD is to you. You can see they rank well, how to prevent acne. And then clearly in their article, they would have a bunch of these different key phrases in there. Maybe talking about different variations around how to cure acne. But they know that you're not going to go right from how to prevent acne to buying the full kit. Okay, next step. We, because of that nice article about how to prevent acne, they taught us about chemical exfoliants. Now we're going to go search some chemical exfoliants and figure out some of the, you know, there's a lot of different terms around this. There's DHA, HSA, there's chemical, there's mechanical exfoliants. What do I need to not straighten my entire face off? And so you can see, Paula's Choice actually has two articles ranking on this one here. Top one's still a magazine, and that's what Google's chosen to pull out. That's probably because it's very well linked to. But then Paula's clearly identified this as when people are searching at this level of skincare, they're a great customer for us. So let's really try to get as much search engine presence as we can. And is there anything they could do at that point, Erin, to improve their ranking, improve their SEO, you know, just with the content that they would be working with? Or um, I think what they'll probably do and what they're probably doing is they're probably trying to build out a whole category or two on their website, whole clusters of information around AHA and BHA. Mm. So their hope is not necessarily that these two pages end up top, but their hope is that for any variation of this phrase that anyone could possibly come up with in all of Google, that it will be a good match to one of their articles and that by having so much about it on their website, all linked together and kind of organized together, mm -hmm. that people will see them as an expert. So there's always going to be they could probably always technically optimize a little better, make it faster, et cetera. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, they could always put more keywords in, but really it's about over time building up that the repository really of knowledge. And then the other side of that is that they are very well linked to by lots of people. So if they can build up more linking from other sites to them, with maybe more bloggery outreach or something like that, it'll keep going. Really, they are probably at the stage where if they just keep doing it, doing their content well, and they don't screw up anything on the website technically, mm -hmm. um, they will probably just continue to see gains in SEO. And anyone entering this year would have a much harder time knocking them down. Unless they go through a site redesign with the company that doesn't know anything about SEO. Then that can mm. be well, and that brings up a good point, because I think sometimes we have clients that will approach us too to ask, should I redo my website? Is it an important time? Can you can you work with what I have? How important is that history, um, potential links that are out there in, in that redesign? It's pretty critical. The thing to remember is Google has a long memory for every website out there. Mm -hmm. um, so if you had a website for, let's say, 10 years at this point, mm -hmm and you decide to switch domains, that's a big deal. That's the domain that Google knew for 10 years, wasn't sending mm -hmm. spam out to anyone, was always responsible with his newsletters, um, was always hosted nicely, was always fast, and now you switched it over to this new strange domain, and it's not quite sure whose that is. Mm -hmm. So if that's 
especially in a domain change situation, if that's not done really, really carefully, it can hurt your SEO for years. Um, what if so you keep the, What if you keep the domain? What if, if What if you keep the domain and just want it to look a little more modern than it has in the past to help your user experience? Then How it does kind that? Of depends on the website. For a lot of websites, if you're like a ten-page website with the about us and the contact mm -hmm. page and the galleries. And you switch it over and you don't do things like make sure each old page redirects to a new page. Um, you might be fine. You'll probably take like a little ding. If, however, you are like a media site, like let's say TechCrunch or something like that, you wouldn't want to touch that redesign without fully mapping out every aspect of how mm -hmm. it's going to be impacted, including 301 redirects for every single piece of content. Um, if content and ranking is your bread and butter, that's your first step in a redesign. It's not an afterthought. And way okay. too often people go through the redesign without without even checking what their agency would do in terms of SEO. Mm -hmm. There's this kind of classic SEO chart up there. It's the graph of Google Analytics and it's organic traffic, organic traffic. Ooh, new site one. Mm -hmm. Oh no. <laughs> so really that's that's something to heavily consider anytime you're doing any substantial website work, especially if you're redesigning switching platform mm -hmm. and if you're switching domains, don't unless you're absolutely sure and you have a plan in place. All right. So on our little user journey, awareness, I have acne, research, okay, chemical exfoliants might help. What are those? Comparison, okay, I figured out some products that have chemical exfoliants in them, and these two seem to be the top ones in the industry. Um, now I'm generally comparing products directly against each other, right? Mm -hmm. And you'll notice there is no college choice URL on this list, although maybe there should be. This is a hard one to optimize for, right? Mm -hmm. um, they could probably do an article that very politely points out some costs and benefits of each, but they'd have to, you know, they'd have to keep it pretty equal between them. And even then, most people are not going to only trust that. I do think that this first one is a little funny though. Poor Paula, that's some negative SEO there. <laughs> um, that's SEO use for evil. <laughs> but so anyway, these are all places that would link to Paula, et cetera. So when you think of SEO, it's not just about your website, ranking, it's about everywhere that might lead to your website linking, ranking too. The comparison phase, this is right before people are getting ready to choose. They're looking, they're generally Googling comparative things. Is this better than this? What are reviews for this? And they're mentally comparing them one against each other. And then choice. Again, this is one where we don't see Paula's choice lining up, uh, they, this might be a missed opportunity for them in some ways, because what I would kind of want to see is Paula's Choice Coupons leads me to paulaschoice.com slash coupons, which lets me put in my email address for 10% off of something with my first purchase. Um, instead, you can see that Deals Plus, Coupon Cabin, and Retail Me Not have really optimized for any version of something coupons. If that is kind of the whole picture of how content plays into a user search, which I think is really critical when you're having a conversation and someone expects insurance to lead to a purchase. Mm -hmm. kind now of what about what about blogs? Um, recently, blogs have been really important, and then it feels like you know in the last year or two, maybe not as critical with blogs. How has that evolution um, happened, and should should our partners and people that we would work with, how should they consider blogs as an important part of their content? I think blogs can still be very useful, but they got very much overpopularized for an amount of time there. Um, they're not going to be an antidote in the SEO world. Too many blogs um, can turn into people just pushing out content to have content, mm -hmm. which does not lend itself to content that people search for. The other side of that is if you are making content that people search for, but you're in any sort of category that's popular, uh, someone's probably already done it perhaps better than you can. And so they might be ranking better than you. And even Polish Choice cannot rank 
at the top for how to solve acne, just because of their authority, who they mm -hmm. are on the internet, they're never going to get the top spot. So I think that's, you know, at first when there were no blogs on the internet, there were tons of topics out there where you could very easily be in the top three if you could just figure out that article, write that niche, and then you'd be sitting there. Now that we're like 10 years on from the blogosphere, most, I mean, a lot of topics have been done to death. Um, search best brownie recipes. What do you think your chances of ranking for that are? Pretty mm -hmm. crappy. So I think the key with the blog is to understand where it's actually going to be valuable, which is it's a great way to create content that you then use for other things. It's great for your newsletter to keep people engaged. It's great mm -hmm. for social to keep them driven. Um, it can be good for SEO, but it generally takes a lot of work to figure out what topics are actually going to be worthwhile and then write topics that fit. Um, but if it's your goal to start competing for, let's say, oh, collision attorneys through blogging, mm -hmm. this is not happen. But this is roughly the, I mean, this is the process I would advise anyone to use if they are following a blog or any type of content. Um, mm -hmm. A blog, you know, a blog page is the same as Google as any other page. It's just a matter of is the content useful. So the first step, we use our, what we call the data loop internally, our user journey tool. And, you know, think through at each step of the journey, what is someone looking for? At first, they're looking for a solution to the problem and they may not even know what that solution is. Then they're researching different solutions. Then they are uh, diving into those solutions and comparing them directly to each other. So you got to figure out, you know, what's kind of what, what's that overall map of decisions that someone makes to arrive at a purchase with me? Okay, okay. Now that I know those, which stages are actually important for me to get in there and start informing them? Do I need to be in at that awareness stage, or does someone have that taken care of and they point them in my category just fine? Mm -hmm. And I just need to catch that search. Um, so you have to kind of think through what stages can I get in and inform that journey? And where is it less competitive so that it makes sense for me to try and do that? If your goal is to explain what a heart attack is, you're probably going to have an uphill battle ranking for that. You might want to be further down the list, further down the journey when someone's searching for a specific solution for a heart attack or something, you know, for a heart mm -hmm. surgery. Mm -hmm. so you prioritize your stages and then you start brainstorming all the different ways your audience could express that need. Um, one of my kind of favorites here is many years ago, I helped do SEO for a home insurance or a home security company. Yeah, uh, cool. Why are we a bad SEO? Why aren't our home security pages ranking? And you go on the website, and every single home security page is listed as residential security. When's the mm. last time you searched residential security? Never. No, you just you, yeah. you search home security <laughs> or alarm system for home. Um, you have the word home in there somewhere, but we don't say, oh, yes, I'm going back to the residence unless we are the Queen of England. So yep. it's really about you got to step in your customer's shoes for this step. And if you don't know, which can happen if you solve kind of a weird need, um, go ask your customers how they would search for you if they were trying to find you again. Okay, so now you've got your fantasy list of keywords. That's when we start going into keyword tools, plugging them in, and then Google will actually give us some um, data about the keyword search volume and how many people are already showing up for it as much data as it can give us. So then your key is to kind of say, okay, these phrases that I think would be good to rank for, this is what Google says. It says this one's really competitive and overcrowded and expensive. It says this one's really hard to get into, but it says this one has one of the searches and it's not competitive. Bingo, that's where I'm gonna start. Yeah. And then finally, you can start writing. And so. That is the content production process. Thing. So much. Yeah. This is the process to get to the writing of it. This is the process for strategizing around it. Um, but it's not, you know, it's not a matter of here are my keywords that I made up in my head and now I want to go write content for them. It really should be something more like this if it's going to be worth your time. Yeah, more methodical. Mm -hmm. 
I like to think of it as like you're laying little internet traps for people. Hmm. Gotcha. All right. So now it is actually time to write the content. And I said earlier that you have to make it so the spiders can read it. How do we do that? Same way you write for college students. <laughs> <laughs> so I don't know how many people's moms tap them down at Fort College. It may just have been me because I was homeschooled. And I was like, okay, when it comes to studying for a test, headlines, bold and italics, images and their subtitles, and then chapter headings. That's what's going to be on the test. That's proven true. Like most, I've had one professor who would choose random things out of the text. And nobody liked this test. <laughs> For the most part, I would agree. <laughs> things are in headlines because they're the most important and they're the topic of the page. Images are chosen because they illustrate the point and they're relative to the page. So here I have um, an example from Paula's page where she's answering the difference between AHA and BHA exfoliants. And you can see how many times they figure out how to work in different phrasing of that, but it doesn't feel unnatural, right? the difference between AHA and BHA exfoliants. How AHA and BHA exfoliants work. How AHA, AHAs and BHA are different. They're really going through what I would think is a person coming to this article, and then they're just making those the headers. You can see they have one header per page followed by subheaders. When they have bolded text, it's relevant. Um, I would guarantee you their images all have descriptive alt text so that if they didn't load, people could still see what they were supposed to be. And then they probably have a great, what's called a meta description and title, which you can't see on the page. That's the interesting thing about metas. Um, but a meta title and a meta description is what is supposed to show on Google. So I'd probably have that optimized too, telling you why you'd want to read that. But there is a technical side to optimizing when you write for Google. But really it is, you know, don't be around the bush. Don't get too, you can have fun with copywriting, but your headlines first and foremost should tell people what it's about and why. But it really is white like it's a college textbook. Well, and it makes sense for the user too. They're going to want to come get valuable information, um, have it then, concise, right to the point. Yeah, they don't want to read. No one wants no. to read anymore. No, we want to scan. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, it should be written like an email for your most distracted boss ever. With enough content for the people who will actually read and dive in. But the main things, they need to be in those key points. This is a really important point that I'm going to go over kind of quickly because it could be a whole book in itself. But the concept of expertise, authority, and trustworthiness. Um, these are terms Google uses with its human testers when it's trying to say, okay, did we link to the scam artist, like the Joe Exotic of Tiger Training, or did we mm. link to someone like the Omaha Zoo of Tiger Info? Just <laughs> <laughs> make it relevant with <laughs> um, a good, It's a good one. <laughs> well, because Google's a real bot. Yeah. It doesn't know who is a scam artist and who is a real mm -hmm. doctor. Um, so this is what Google's looking for. It's looking for, did you list your expertise? Is there more info on this out or elsewhere? So you can see on this article, they've got references uh, for the information. They've got footnotes detailing out where they read it, what pages. And they've got a little blurb on, here's this best-selling author about books. Here's where she's shown. Here's her team. There's a lot of information out there about why this is credible, credible and trustworthy. We see both Google and YouTube and Facebook really, really focusing on that with more information about where the website's from, who made it, why they made it, who's paying for it, things like that. So if your website doesn't have that information on it, if it's just, oh, I mean, I think of a business website I stumbled across recently. I could not figure if they were, figure out if they were a legitimate business in the United States or just mm -hmm. a shell for China. So they had no address, one yeah. phone number. No people anywhere. Um, you really have to make sure you're, you know, it has to look credible. It has to be credible, but mostly it has to look credible. Links this is everyone's favorite part. Mm -hmm. So this is critical because, again, it's like, it's like someone voting on your post. It's like an up, 
It's like a thumbs up on your post on Facebook. It's like saying, this is valuable. I care about this. So links kind of fall into two factors. And I think the biggest part of this is understanding how Google was different from search engines that came before it. So search engines that came before Google um, tended to operate based off of what keywords you plugged in the page. So pages, you can still do this. You can still say, hey, these are the keywords for the page I am making. Um, but Google won't pay any attention to them at all. Old search engines used to be, okay, this page is about dogs, dog treats, dog fur, dog brushing. I think this website's telling me it's about dogs. And so the person who can kind of slam in the most key phrases or the right key phrases just into the back end of their website won. But that's not the best consumer experience, right? Mm -hmm. so helpful little doodle here. I sell the best dogs, puppies, fish on freezes, labradoodles. That's a scam artist. That's a puppy mill. We don't want them to rank top. Mm-hmm. So what Sergey Brin and Larry Page came up with was actually based on academic talks and studies, whereas in academia, it's all about being cited, right? You want to write things, and then you want other people to cite your things when they write their things, because that means you had an opinion worth pointing out. And so that's the same model they use for ranking websites online. They say, hey, this website on heart disease was linked to by this website made up of doctors. So we think this heart disease one is better than Joe's heart disease website that claims that eating more bacon is the best path forward. So that's what Google's doing with links is it's saying if the website is linked to a lot, it's probably more credible and probably higher value. It's like an upvote. And does that just happen over time, that natural linking, Aaron, or is there a way to support that? There are ways to support it, but first, you have to understand that not all links are equal in mm-hmm. either. Um, and this is some. This is part of Google's algorithm or system that they're constantly revising and working over time, um, is how it judges different links. So there's authority versus relevance. So my example there of this doctor's website is saying, it's linking to this heart article and it says it's really credible. That's an example that's both authoritative and relative, right? Doctors, hearts, they're the authority on hearts and they also are heavily involved in them. Now, White House Gov is authoritative, right? If that's linking to you, that's great, but it might not always be relevant. Similarly, if you're looking for a puppy, Aaron's puppyadvice.com, I might be less of an authority. I might just be a wacko who really likes puppies, but because I'm relevant, that link matters. Yep. So there's a balancing act between those two things when it comes to a link. Um, one trend that Google's always fighting is basically if there's an easy way out there to go and get links to your website, Google's going to eventually figure out and cheapen those links. Uh, so it used to be a thing when blogs were huge and everyone was trying to get their first mommy blog started. Mm-hmm. Everyone would go around and they'd post comments on all of each other's blogs and you would link your blog and your comments and you would do more comments to get more links back to your blog to hopefully rank higher. Um, people would like exchange links, um, all sorts of ways that people could get links to their website. Forums, signatures, people used to spam those. Um, and all of those Basically, whenever something gets popular enough, Google comes in and says, "Uh -uh, Mm uh-uh, no, your links are garbage. We're devaluing them and we might even devalue you. (laughs) I own you. (laughs) Well, I mean, if you are, let's say, a Wisconsin dentist with a whole lot of links from Russian websites, Mm -hmm. Google's kind of like, no. No, no, Um, you're not from Eau Claire. So all links really are not built equal. Now this is this is maybe the biggest area where you can actually hurt your site. If you have the wrong types of sites linking to you, you can lie guy up, down with the dogs, get up to the police type deal. Google assumes you're related to those people who link to you. Mm-hmm. And finally, there's internal links, which we talked about. That's when you are linking one web page to another within your own website, right? Those don't exactly count to Google in the same way. Like you can't vote for your own page. Um, But it does help those little spiders organize your website content. 
and understand how this page relates to this page, relates to this topic. So it can help SEO, but not as directly as, say, getting a really authoritative, uh, relevant link here. On the does this happen naturally phase, mm -hmm. um, Google says it does. <laughs> um, so there's natural links, which happens, I mean, it happens a little, it happens actually probably more now than it did at the beginning of the internet. So if you think back to the beginning of the internet, you could only have a web page if you knew how to write an HTML, host a server, and do all this technical stuff. Mm -hmm. So when you decided to actually go hand code a link to someone else's website, that was like a huge wow, you love them, that's a huge vote. That was the first type of natural linking that occurred. Now, um, that's more likely to be a newspaper article found it, someone tweeted it, someone shared it. So a natural link is what we might call an earned link, um, where you wrote some good content or you got featured maybe in media. Um, if you're doing press releases and you got featured for sponsoring an event or something and that news story gets picked up, that can be a natural link. And those are the best. Um, one kind of helpful way to maybe get some of those natural links and that I don't think people always think about is if you're sponsoring local events, a lot of local um, charities and nonprofits tend to be fairly authoritative, right? Mm -hmm. And a lot of them tend to link to your website when you sponsor their event. So always keep that in mind. I don't, I don't see many nonprofits pushing kind of the value of that link, but it's actually, it's, it's not worthless. It's, it's helpful to your SEO. And I see you've got social down a little bit, Erin. Yep. You know, would would that be considered a natural link if if they're sharing that on social because that's become such a powerful media? Yes and no. Um, so, for instance, Twitter is indexed by Google unless you're private. So, if you're linking something on Twitter, yes, that is technically seen as a link from Twitter to that website. Mm -hmm. But it's devalued because Google knows that that happens all the time every day. It's not the same as if the New York Times wrote an article on LinkedIn. Um, Facebook, however, most links that you post there are not easily indexable by Google. So that may not even count at all. And then the flip side of this is sites that explicitly ask for links like Google My Business or Yahoo or, um, oh, it's the Yelp. Mm. Mm -hmm. Those listing sites used to be really heavily used for link building. People would go and find all the most obscure listing sites, directories out there, and you'd have to pay $20 to get listed or something. And there were whole scams out there. Um, but now those listing site URLs are kind of more expected rather than not. Mm -hmm. Manual outreach is when you actually go and you ask someone for a link. And Google does not like this. But Google often doesn't know if it's happening or not. So if you can find a way to do manual outreach that's not automated and not something you can easily shut down, that's probably a great technique. Um, but technically, Google thinks all your links should be natural. I think it's kind of fantasy, but it, yeah, that seems like that would be hard to do. I'm going to currently skip through this one because this is what we're going to cover actually next week on our much uh, our local SEO side where we talk about kind of differences between local SEO and what you would see on a more national scale. But I will leave you with a warning. Google is watching for natural looking link profiles, right? If you're that site in Wisconsin and the whole Russian mafia is linking to you from their network, those like dark internet sites, <laughs> Google's probably gonna be a little like, no. And that can get you kind of like really fast. So do not jump on fads and don't stress out too much about the amount of links unless you are competing on a national scale for them. Because again, most small businesses aren't going to have 200 links to them generally. Google knows that. Google will adjust the scale. All right. We climbed to the top of the pyramid. Safi always gone a bit longer than I thought it would. That's okay. SEO is a big topic and it's not easy. It is a big topic. We've got a whole other PowerPoint to go through next week. I'm sure everybody should dying for it. There are 200 things to consider to thousands. <laughs> what to do. <laughs> All right. So at the very tippy top, this is what Google is always working towards is rank brain or just kind of how their algorithm run itself, really. Um, so rank brain uses 
artificial intelligence to predict the best search results based on what the AI knows about all of it, which includes the connection between the links and the content you've been browsing and your own behavior. I think the best way to illustrate this is through comics, like everything else. So I've stolen these comics from some other people. All right, this is from Backlink, though. This is the way, you know, Google engineers work with the algorithm. They say, okay, I wonder if we change all the font type very, very slightly. Will that work or not? Or if I change, if I change this part of the algorithm just a little bit and tweak it, do they get better results or not? <clears throat> so I test it. Then they have human testers actually Google and see, hey, do these results look better or not? Testers say yes, no, and then they either permanently implement the change or they don't implement it. And you've probably even run across some stuff like this. You aren't a Google tester, but maybe they rolled out something just to see if it worked. And you're like, hmm. So this is the manual way of doing it, right? Manually updating the algorithm. This is the rank brain way of doing it again, shamelessly stolen from backlink out. Um, user satisfaction is low for these search results. They search something and let's say you don't even click. If you do a Google search, fluffy dogs, non, oh my example, the dogs, fluffy dogs, non allergenic, um, under 20 pounds. It's all results that come. Oh, no, this is quite fit in the bill. I need to find. So you go back and you find a new way to search it, and a new way to search it. So Google says, okay, user satisfaction is low for these search results. Someone searched something, and they didn't find what they expected to find. And I can tell because they didn't click on anything. They went back. So okay, now we're going to adjust some slight algorithm factor on here to see if this makes a better result. Lo and behold, more users start clicking through on that search. Google permanently implements that algorithm change. So it's basically taking the same thing engineers were doing here and making it completely automatic. What this means is that even Google most likely cannot tell you why something is ranking the way it is for you. They're so smart. Yes. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they, they wanted to stop answering that question, so they decided to say the robot's doing it all. <laughs> All right, so how does this impact SEO? Even more than ever, this takes that whole D&D Dungeons and Dragons rule book idea and mm -hmm. throws it out the window, right? There, there's no tiny checklist of things to follow to get to step one. Instead, it's about building for humans. It's about really thinking through that user journey, figuring out how you can be relevant at each step of it, what content will guide someone to you throughout that, building that content in a valuable way, and then sharing it in ways to get it out to your audience. Um, it's not necessarily specifically about asking for links from different people. It's really about thinking about your user when it comes to rank brain. And it is about some SEO optimization. It's important to make your search engine, your SERP there, that means search engine results page. Um, it is important to make that stand out with a good title and a good description because that's what's going to make people choose to click or not. It's like an ad. Um, so Rank Brain is really all about making your website, content, and whole experience better than the next guys. Unless about a specific little set of your title needs to be exactly 110 characters long or something. All right. I promise you're almost to the end and you will be able to feed your children soon. <laughs> Well, and I wonder too, you know, if someone's listening or when someone finishes this, Aaron, what what steps should they take? You know, we've shared a lot of information. What would be, okay, I need to look at my links. I need to look at this. How, how would they go about taking all this information and applying it to their website to make sure that if they are um, considering SEO for their business, they're doing it the right way? I would say the most useful thing you can do, um, go to the web page we set up, datamarketing.com slash WTFSEO. And on that page, we do have links to Google Webmaster Tools. Mm -hmm. So just get signed up for Google Webmaster Tools. Get signed up for Google Analytics if you're not already. And start just monitoring your website. Mm -hmm. And that is really the place to start, is with data, to see how it's getting found now. Google Webmaster Tools will tell you anything that's truly really critically blocking your website, and then you know where to start. Um, my advice on where not to start is with a stranger who emails you an audit. 
Hmm. I see a lot of that with some of you. Dear sir or madam, your website is great, except it has 500 errors. Here is the list. Without these, with these errors, you will never rank on Google. No, like just, that's like the, yeah, you want to put that person up to your front door, so don't let them hear you. Yeah, yeah. But really the key for this is what Google is trying to do is serve the best results to the user so that the user keeps using Google. Yes. If you help Google further that goal, Google favors you. If you don't, Google does not favor you. Remember when Google Glass was a thing? Yeah. I <laughs> shut my blinds there. <laughs> So it went, went from like dark and gloomy to gorgeous out, so. Oh, it's nice, we gotta wrap this up then. Yeah. <laughs> All right, so let's Google up now in the future. Well, this is really currently. Um, they're working on enhanced maps. There's a whole lot of articles out there on kind of this map war between Google and Apple, which is really interesting. Why are they going to so much detail in maps? It's for self-driving cars, right? It's to figure mm -hmm. out how can we implement augmented reality and self-driving cars and be the owners of that new platform too. It's not just about finding directions. It's about platforming cars. So that's really interesting because talk about a captive audience for advertising. Um, this is a huge one, booking of hotels, airlines, any sports through Google. Google is really trying to insert themselves as that transaction broker of the internet. They've become mm -hmm. less of a, sorry, go on. Oh, no, I was agreeing. Just thinking it's interesting the direction that they're going. Yeah, they have an interesting habit here, which is that they sit and they wait for that vertical to figure it out, and then they come and they just eat it for lunch. Mm. Great strategy. It's like they waited until the airlines and hotels and, like, you know, Kayak went through all the work of training us. Mm -hmm. Kayak.com. And now you search cheap flights, you get Kayak.com or any Google homepage. So if you are in and industry vertical that has not yet had some transaction brokerage happen, it's only a matter of time. Google is letting someone else do the training. And kind of similar to that is more and more Google is turning away from a search engine that links you to somewhere else and more is trying to be the self-contained thing that solves the problem for you. Everything from finding the result, you know, a rich snippet that says what the HA is versus having to go to Paula's website mm -hmm. to maybe selling you the acne cream through Google Shop. So Google really is trying to own that whole journey. Um, this is kind of scary from an SEO perspective because it means that SEO is getting harder and your SEO efforts will start to pay off more for Google than they might for you. So I think it's always really critical to be thinking not only of what am I doing on Google for free, but how I position myself to be the customer because that's how I know I won't get screwed. Mm -hmm. You might still get all of us screwed, but not as screwed as if you, if, <laughs> like if you are a golf tea time aggregator, your time is very limited. I'd cash out now. All right. So that was part one of our SEO training. Next week, we will dive into local SEO with an emphasis a little more on reviews, Google My Business, um, listings, and how that'll impact especially local businesses. Because that game is just a little different. Like, you would not expect your local dermatologist to be competing with Paula's Choice and churning out, mm -hmm. you know, a magazine's worth of content on acting every week. So Google, and, it's and Google, yeah, and Google recognizes that too. So there is hope for the little guy. There is hope for the little guy. Google is not completely out to squish us. <laughs> <laughs> if it is, it's just like Godzilla. It's so big it didn't recognize us. <laughs> but with that. Agreed. Don't be evil and check out our landing page for more resources. Download uh, the whole PowerPoint. It's got a lot more details in it. It can help you kind of reference things. And then that landing page has resources as well. Um, if you have any SEO questions, you can reach us through that landing page. Um, or I'm just Erin at datamarketing.com. I have lots of emails, so feel free to send me one.
Thanks, Aaron. It feels good. Um, with SEO, it can be really overwhelming and there's a lot that goes into it. And I think if someone comes to us or we've had partners, I wanna be on that first page. There's a lot that goes into it and, and there is a little bit of method to the madness. So it'll be nice to review and outline that. So thank you. Yeah, there's, there's definitely a strategy that he is just to remember that in many ways you are trying to play against, uh, it's like playing in a casino, right? How mm -hmm. sort of things. So how can you win with the house, not against the house? Because you will never win against the house. Start counting your cards. <laughs> <laughs> See, that, that's what the guys who pop in your inbox with the free eyes want you to do. <laughs> Psychology. <laughs> All right, well, yeah, All right. I will let you get going for tonight. Thanks for joining me for your yes. chat. Cheers, thank you. Cheers, talk to you later. Bye-bye.